Welcome to Middle East Dialogues, a series of conversations with leading scholars and writers, produced by the University of Denver's Center for Middle East Studies. Your host for this episode is Nader Hashimi, the director of the center and the associate professor at the University of Denver's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. Our guest for this episode is Laura Sikor. Sikor has written about Iran for The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Foreign Affairs, The New Republic, as well as other publications. She has worked at The New York Times, The Boston Globe, The American Prospect, and Lingua Franca. She has also been a fellow at the New York Public Library's Coleman Center and the American Academy in Berlin. In addition, she has taught journalism at NYU and Princeton. Today we'll be discussing her first full-length book, Children of Paradise, The Struggle for the Soul of Iran. Welcome to the University of Denver and congratulations on your new book. Thank you so much. Um, I, was, I spent the last couple of days reading the book and it's, a, it's an important contribution and there's this uh, quotation in the preface of the book that in my view sort of summarizes um, sort of the book in broad terms. I want, it, I want to read you that, that passage and then get you to comment on it. Uh, you write that um, Iran is not a happy place but it's a supremely dignified one, a country that has wrested its destiny from the design of great powers, experimented with a form of government never seen before on earth, and kept the experiment alive with a spirit of constant questioning that has threatened dissidents' views, and the very lives of the dissidents who articulate the, these views. Wherever Iran goes, you say, it will get there on its own terms. What did you mean by that? Well, there's a lot packed into that passage, yeah. um, and it is sort of a, yeah, it's a kind of global impression of a country and a political process that I had been observing at, at somewhat close range. Um, you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the system of government that came out of the revolution, is, um, it is unique in the world, and it has sort of embedded within it a source of constant tension and dynamism. and. This is, in a way, the subject of, of my book, and it's also the sort of generative tension that keeps producing um, factions and conflict and political contestation inside a system that's ostensibly closed. Mm. So I was sort of, I, I never ceased to be sort of amazed and impressed by that process, both the way that it, um, that it involves people outside the political system and the sort of how Iran, Iranians in civil society manage to make themselves heard and to try to, to move the debate and move the political system in directions favorable to, um, to its interests and how people inside navigate mm -hmm. that, um, that set of hierarchies and tensions and, and, um, and conflicts. So to some extent, I think that that dynamism is gonna drive this country wherever it is that it needs to go. <laughs> um, it's not always, um, it's not always fast, and it's not always um, satisfying, mm -hmm. but it's, it seems to me that this is a country that has a kind of revolutionary energy that is not expended. Mm -hmm. And you're quoted as saying somewhere, I think it was an interview that you gave up in Canada or to a Canadian um, journalist, that the more that you study Iran, the more that you come to the conclusion that this is really not about religion. That's and that's right. counterintuitive to how most people think about Iran. What do you mean by that statement? I think that sometimes when we think about Iran purely as an example of Islamist government, it obscures a great deal, and it becomes kind of mystifying in a way that, um, that those of us from um, outside Iran, or specifically mm -hmm. from Western countries, sort of look at Iran and say, well, this is, this is a country governed by Sharia law, and we'll never understand it. Um, and I don't think that's, that's accurate or helpful. I think that in a lot of ways, um, what you see in Iran is familiar. The, the apparatus of repression mm -hmm. is very familiar, mm -hmm. and the techniques by which it's carried out are very familiar. So you have, you have struggles for power mm -hmm. that are not exotic mm -hmm. here, and that have to do with the prerogatives of the people who hold it, mm -hmm. and the desires of the people who don't, and that, um, that ought, to, that ought to be looked at in the same frame that we look at autocratic governments 
that don't have a religious basis. Mm -hmm. That said, the religious basis is not meaningless, right. and it certainly you know this is this is a piece of what makes this system unique. It has a um, it has this kind of dual basis of legitimacy, half grounded, not half, less than half, mm -hmm. grounded in the consent of the governed, and another portion of it grounded in the will of God. Mm -hmm. So this is not, you know, I don't mean to trivialize that aspect. Right. Um, how much legitimacy would you say the current Islamic system has in the eyes of its, of its people? To what extent would you sort of consider it to be a, quote, legitimate government that has support from significant segments of uh, its own population? I think that's a really hard question to answer, partly because we don't have an accurate measure of mm -hmm. the view of the Iranian people. Um, and I think it's sometimes dangerous to presume that we, that we do based on anecdotal um, evidence. Mm -hmm. you know, as, a, as a foreigner traveling in Iran, I was often amazed at the pervasiveness of the critique of the system. Right. Um, it was hard often to find people mm -hmm. who supported the system as it was, mm -hmm. um, even, even when I looked for them. Right. Um, on the other hand, those people certainly do exist, and there is certainly a basis for, um, for the regime that is, you know, that's po that there is a popular basis for the regime and its mm -hmm. policies. How large it is, what portion of the population yeah. it is, I don't think that we have a way of determining. Right. Um, yeah. It's a difficult subject to sort of put your finger on because even those people that you profile in the book, yeah. the dissidents, they were um, supporters of the revolution and I would argue still that many of them still support the ideals of the revolution itself mm -hmm. and still view current political leaders in Iran. Yeah. The president, current president Rouhani, previous presidents um, um, Rafsanjani and Khatami as, as sort of figures of, of, of sort of, you know, positive uh, um, sort of potential support for democratic transition and values. So, so even if we were to look at the, you know, the opposition um, mm -hmm. segments of society, they, they, the, the black and white view that some people have of Iran really doesn't, I think, hold true. Yeah, thank you for making that distinction. Because I, I should say that I made a decision also in mm -hmm. writing this book. What I was interested in was the reform movement. Right. So I was not writing about people who just say, you know, that the whole thing is illegitimate and they right. just and they just want to either avoid it or rip right. it up. I was looking for the people who were trying to find a way to work within this system. Yeah. And that is a that is a real constituency and yeah. not a small one. Right. Um, and these people, yes, they they have a lot of complaints about the way the country is governed. They have a lot of complaints about the parts of the government that are not elected or responsive to the people, but they do continue to work with the parts that they believe are or should be responsive to the people, and they do continue to see avenues mm -hmm. to, to press for change. Mm -hmm. So let me now ask you sort of the big U.S. foreign policy question, and I think many Americans, particularly those who are deeply involved in U.S. foreign policy debates, will I think uh, get from your book. I think most people would be very sympathetic to the portrayal of the book, the people, the dissidents who are suffering under an authoritarian system and who aspire to democratic political change. But then many Americans will say, look, you know, we sympathize with those people in Iran who share our values and who want to bring about change. But time is not on our side. We can't wait forever for Iranian Democrats to get their house in order to bring about political change. Iran's current regime is sowing mayhem and chaos throughout the region. It is um, the biggest state sponsor of terrorism. And President Obama really dropped the ball by playing nice with Iran. It allowed it to get away with a lot of sort of egregious policies. We need a harder line. Mm. And even if that harder line means that some of these people in the book are going to perhaps suffer from sanctions or the possibility of, you know, a military confrontation, from a U.S. national security perspective, we cannot allow Iran to get away with its bad behavior. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that argument? I think in a way there is a conflation of a couple of different questions, which is a part of the American foreign policy debate around Iran. The notion that that okay, so, so we know that there is a um, an active um, political, if not opposition, sort of dissident movement within the Islamic Republic. The fact that we know this exists and that we know that dissidents are are badly mistreated and make enormous sacrifices for the betterment of their country, this does not suggest that the United States should base a foreign policy on its prediction or its desire for political change inside of Iran. 
Um, and I think that's kind of, it's kind of hard to tease these things apart and to say, well, we want to support these people. We see these people as sharing our values. Therefore, um, we should we should do what? We mm -hmm. should, um, I think there are elements um, on the right who have argued for supporting democratic elements in Iran mm -hmm. to overthrow their government, mm -hmm. which is a very unpopular position among democratic elements in Iran, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. um, there are elements in American policy circles who say that, yes, we should either wait for or attempt to work for mm -hmm. um, a regime change mm -hmm. in Iran. I don't think that was the Obama administration's position. I don't think that they negotiated mm -hmm. the nuclear agreement on the grounds that they expected a change of regime. Mm -hmm. I think they negotiated the nuclear agreement on the grounds that the regime that currently exists, exists mm -hmm. and needs to be dealt with because it is a player and a significant player mm -hmm. in um, conflicts and um, and surrounding interests mm -hmm. that are important both to the United States and to the world. So the question of whether and how you deal with a regime that you dislike, mm -hmm. that may see its interests as opposed to your interests, mm -hmm. that is the, the underlying foreign policy question mm -hmm. that American foreign policymakers you know, need, need to address. Yeah. And your answer is what to that, <laughs> that debate? I'm, I'm for engagement. Yeah. I think that there is no way forward that doesn't recognize yeah. that the Islamic Republic, and I'm not, um, you know, I've, I've certainly written plenty critically about mm -hmm. the Islamic Republic, mm -hmm. but I don't think that there is a way forward that doesn't um, accept the fact that this is who one deals with mm -hmm. in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact is that there are now pressing regional questions mm -hmm. that the Islamic Republic is engaged with, that the United States is engaged with, mm -hmm. that can't be resolved without engagement. Mm -hmm. Okay, final question about the future. Um, we have a new president, his name is Donald Trump, and he has targeted Iran as sort of a, a country that he wants to um, you know, confront in terms of its policies. We've already seen the, original, the, the early signs of sort of a, a major shift from Obama to Trump in terms of um, um, U.S. relations with the Islamic Republic. Um, what are your thoughts on the new Trump administration and its policies toward Iran? What will this mean for the people in the book that you profile? Um, and is there any sort of um, course of action that you could recommend that perhaps could um, provide a, a more reasonable policy that we might pursue with, with, with respect to the Islamic Republic of Iran? I think we're kind of at a moment of wait and see because we don't actually know what the Trump administration's policy toward Iran is going to be. Um, I think there are some really puzzling variables in that mm -hmm. picture. And part of how we view this is gonna depend on how we see the Trump administration defining its strategic priorities, which it really has not yet done. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, if it's the case, as Trump said on the campaign trail, that his priority is the elimination of ISIS mm -hmm. and that he doesn't wish to get engaged in foreign wars mm -hmm. in the Middle East, <laughs> um, and that he also sees a strategic partnership with Russia, it is hard to puzzle out exactly how this all comes to be without Iranian participation, because Russian actions in the Middle East suggest that its strategic partner there mm -hmm. is Iran. Mm -hmm. So um, if the Trump administration's policy is to attempt to drive a wedge between Russia and Iran, how does it then see resolving the various crises mm -hmm. that, um, that are currently um, where, where currently the Russians and the Iranians are collaborating. Yeah. So I'm curious to see exactly how they plan to work that out. On the other hand, you know that a number of, of major figures in the Trump foreign policy team do have a particular animus toward Iran and do believe that um, the nuclear deal was, uh, was a mistake and that a more confrontational approach to Iran is necessary. So these are competing priorities. Mm -hmm. and. I'm not convinced that I understand just yet which ones take precedence. Yeah. Well, you know, I could talk to you for another couple of hours, but you have to give a talk um, fairly soon, so I don't want to exhaust you. I just want to, again, thank you for the book. Uh, because we sort of write and research on similar topics, I'm, I'm certain that if this book gets into the hands or gets translated into Persian, the people who read it from within Iran and who've been very much involved in these struggles will really be um, um, very satisfied and extremely happy with your um, attempt to humanize what they have been you know, going through for the last 37 years. So thank you for the book and we look forward to your next uh, you know, big intellectual contribution. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Thanks. Great to have you.